As of the 1920s, the Gold Coast members of the National Congress of British West Africa, an independence movement, included a substantial representation of merchants, even though lawyers predominated, in contrast with their much smaller role in other African countries. But spearheading the drive for independence was a man much more typical of the African leadership of that era, Kwame Nkrumah, a Western-educated political activist who had no substantial background in anything else. His special appeal was to the young and the semi-educated, and his political style has been characterized as ritualistic or mystical in an ideological or cult of personality sense. His imprisonment for sedition under the colonial government gave him an added appeal to his constituency. As a result of the electoral success of his party in the 1951 elections, Nkrumah was invited from prison to head up the government that would lead Ghana into independence. Kwame Nkrumah had sweeping ideological goals, sweeping not only within Ghana, but also a sweeping pan-Africanism with which he hoped to form a transnational black African unified superstate. Under Nkrumah, power was centralized in the national government as against regional and local bodies. It was centralized in the executive, which subordinated the legislative and judicial branches. Ultimately, power was concentrated in Nkrumah himself, who banned opposition parties, had political adversaries imprisoned without charges for years under preventive detention, and replaced the professional elite in the civil and military services with his own hand-picked men. Beginning its independence with more human and natural resources than most other black African nations, a higher per capita income, and large foreign reserves, Ghana experienced an almost immediate economic decline in the post-colonial era. By 1965, Ghana's foreign reserves of nearly half a billion dollars in 1958 had turned into a foreign debt of a billion dollars. Nkrumah's economic policies were ambitious, if not effective. He built many prestige projects, including a $16 million hall for one meeting of the Organization of African Unity and a national airline, even though 15 international carriers were flying into Ghana. In 1966, while Nkrumah was en route to China, a military coup ended his regime in Ghana. He went into exile in Guinea, whose president, Seko Touré, gave him the honorific title co-president. The new government in Ghana had its own problems and excesses. Scores of Mercedes automobiles were flown in for the new rulers, at a cost of more than $100,000 each, plus shipping. Half the foreign exchange received by the government's cocoa marketing agency was unaccounted for. The country's leading export, cocoa, suffered from government controls. The tonnage of cocoa beans and cocoa butter exported both declined sharply between 1966 and 1969, the former by 40 percent in just three years, and the latter by more than half over the same period. Exports of manganese and bauxite also fell. Stores became bare. Transportation broke down. Ghanaians began fleeing to the Ivory Coast and Liberia. From an economy that had been growing during the 1950s, there was now a slight reduction in real output per person for the decade of the 1960s and a steeper reduction of 2.65 percent per annum between 1970 and 1982. Over this latter period, Ghana's foreign debt rose from less than one-fourth of its annual output to more than a third more than its total output. A second coup in 1978 led by a young Air Force lieutenant named Jerry Rawlings, replaced the existing military government and began executing its leaders for corruption, including the former head of state, who was accused of banking $100 million of ill-gotten gains in foreign countries. A year later, Rawlings returned power to civilian hands. But the country's economic woes continued. Its national debt rose, it fell years behind schedule in repaying its loans, and inflation exceeded 100 percent per annum. Roads and trucks both fell into such disrepair that the cocoa crop could not be moved to the ports to be exported, and began piling up in government warehouses. At the end of 1981, Lieutenant Rawlings again seized power, and soldiers began looting the shops in the capital of Accra. Civilians also looted, with police looking on. Rawlings' policies had a strong idealistic and populist flavor, including price controls that, among other things, made it uneconomic to produce cocoa, the country's most important crop. 
Exchange rates fixed by the government made it uneconomic for foreign industrial firms to continue operating in Ghana, causing drastic cutbacks in employment and earnings. The country's total output declined absolutely, at an average rate of 4% per year during the early 1980s, and investment fell by one-third. Ghana's per capita income, which had been more than double that of Nigeria in 1965, was less than half that of Nigeria by 1985. Food shortages developed, the number of doctors declined, as did life expectancy. Rawlings, however, remained popular in Ghana, an economic failure but a political success. In 1983, however, he made a fundamental change in Ghana's economic policies, following recommendations of the World Bank. The government began to free up the market in various ways. It ended most price controls, devalued the currency internationally, and laid off 50,000 civil servants from a bloated bureaucracy that had increased in size nearly tenfold between 1972 and 1982. Government-owned businesses were put up for sale. The response of the economy was dramatic. Ghana's economic growth rate from 1983 to 1988 averaged 6% per annum. Once bare store shelves began to fill up with consumer goods, streets began to be clogged with imported cars. Reversing years of government policy of keeping cocoa prices to the farmers artificially low, the government tripled the price paid to the producers. Over the next five years, cocoa production rose by 20%, and the smuggling of cocoa to neighboring countries declined. Ghana's economic turnaround was not only a major contrast to its past under Nkrumah and later statist regimes, but was also in sharp contrast to continued economic deterioration in much of sub-Saharan Africa, where per capita output actually declined 5% in 1987. Over the years, along with economic and social benefits, the colonial government created many grievances. As elsewhere, it also created a new westernized class among the indigenous population, a group of educated and semi-educated people with a vision of the future for their country that was unlike either the traditional past or the colonial present. Not incidentally, it was to be a future in which these westernized elite would rise to the top, the campaign for independence in Tanganyika was led by a Western-educated former schoolteacher, Julius K. Nyerere. Nyerere's Tanganyika African National Union, TANU, mobilized discontent and ambition, first among the westernized, educated, and semi-educated Africans. Despite the colonial government's resistance and repression, TANU achieved its principal goal. Tanganyika became independent in 1961. Its union with Zanzibar three years later created the new nation of Tanzania. Tanzania still bears the cultural imprint of colonial rule. Swahili, its official language, was spread under German auspices, and its capital city, Dar es Salaam, was built by Arabs and has an Arabic name. As president of Tanzania, Julius Nereri became known internationally for his lofty goals and humanitarian statements that caused him to be called the conscience of Africa. At home, he tried to impose his vision of an egalitarian, socialist society by authoritarian methods. By government edict, a majority of Tanzania's population was grouped into villages, whether they wanted to be or not. As with so many other communal agricultural schemes in various nations and eras, those in Tanzania led to peoples doing as little work as possible on the communal crop and as much as possible on their own individual plots. Tanzania's output per worker declined over a period of a decade, and the country went from being an exporter of maize to being an importer. Hundreds of nationalized firms went bankrupt. The railroad from Tanzania to Zambia broke down so often that the Africans who ran it were replaced by Chinese, at virtually all levels. Once prosperous Zanzibar suffered the economic decline of the rest of Tanzania, and was often without electricity. All this occurred in a country that received more foreign aid per capita than any other, and which had large unpaid loans extended for years at zero interest. On the political front, Nereri jailed thousands of political prisoners, more than South Africa, at one point in the 1970s, and many were tortured, according to Amnesty International.
Nereri was repeatedly unopposed in elections, which he won by majorities attained elsewhere only in communist countries. He also helped overthrow three other African governments, including the Amin regime in Uganda, which Nereri replaced with his own puppet rulers, the latter being replaced in turn and jailed by Nereri when the Tanzanian leader disapproved of their performance. Yet his unassuming lifestyle and personality, and his idealistic statements, made him an enormous favorite of Western intellectuals. What the seventeen million Tanzanians thought of Nereri could not be known, for Tanzania was a one-party state with a government-controlled press, and a society honeycombed with party cells that made the free expression of opinion dangerous. The economic debacle in Tanzania reached virtually every kind of activity agricultural or industrial, domestic or foreign. Cotton production, which was 79,000 tons in the mid-1960s, fell to about 50,000 tons by the early 1980s. Over a period of a decade, cashew production fell by more than 50 percent, and sisal production by nearly 60 percent. The industrial sector, by the 1980s, was operating at from 10 to 30 percent of capacity. The total output of the country was declining and inflation averaged 35 percent per year. Perhaps most decisive of all, the Nereri regime in Tanzania finally began to lose its credibility with international lending and donor organizations, which had subsidized its policies in the past. From 1980 to 1985, per capita real income in Tanzania fell by 12 percent. The resignation of Julius Nereri as president of Tanzania in late 1985 and the inauguration of Ali Hassan Mawini as the new president marked a policy change as well as a change of personalities. A modest degree of relaxation of government control in the economy began to produce signs of economic recovery, including the first rise in per capita real income in nearly a decade. These changing policies also produced internal dissension within the ruling party, still headed by Nereri after relinquishing the presidency. However, by 1990, Tanzania had achieved four consecutive years of growth in real national output and enacted a new constitution permitting multi-party elections. Clearly, some of the lessons of the mistakes of the immediate post-independence era had been learned, and at least the beginnings of important changes made. The post-independence history of the Ivory Coast diverged considerably from that of other African nations during its first two decades. But this divergence was the deliberate choice of one leader, and was, in that sense, very much like the authoritarianism common elsewhere in post-independence Africa. Félix Opoet Poigny was an early political leader in French West Africa, with a movement centered in the Ivory Coast and articulating the grievances of his fellow Africans against French colonial policies. Even so, he was seeking amelioration under colonial rule, not independence. Oufouet Bonny was the French-educated son of an African chief. Born in 1905, he became a physician, a wealthy planter, and a public health official before entering politics in 1944. He spent a dozen years in France, beginning in 1946, first as the Ivory Coast's representative in Parliament, and then as the first African to hold a cabinet position in a European government. The cultural assimilation and acceptance of the small group of educated Africans as black Frenchmen operated to mute anti-colonialism and to co-opt its potential indigenous leaders. But the fall of France in World War II and the rise of a Nazi puppet government in Vichy undermined the legitimacy of French rule, while the racist and exploitative policies the Vichy government followed in the African colonies under Nazi auspices provoked resistance and sabotage. The African solidarity this promoted was one of the ingredients in the post-war movement toward independence. After the war, Houphouet Boigny won great popularity in 1946 for his role in bringing to an end the hated system of forced labor. New civil and political rights followed piecemeal over the years. In 1960, the Ivory Coast became an independent republic within the international French community, with Houphouet Boigny as its first president. The post-independence policies of the Ivory Coast differed sharply from those of most other African nations in a number of ways. It avoided executions or coups, and long resisted the widespread policy of building showcase industries that could not pay for themselves. 
It also imposed few restrictions on the transfer of foreign capital or profits, and did not succumb to the political temptation to drive out foreigners in order to turn their jobs over to Africans. There were more Frenchmen in the Ivory Coast in the 1980s than there were at the time of independence twenty years earlier, and they filled many important positions in government and the economy. This produced resentments among newly educated Africans seeking careers and urging political Africanization. The Ivory Coast also made use of technical experts from Taiwan and improved seeds from Brazil, India, and the Philippines. During the 1980s, the World Bank estimated that foreigners held four-fifths of all jobs in the Ivory Coast requiring a college degree. As of the time of independence, the Ivory Coast was one of the poorest nations in Africa and in the world. However, despite an initially low level of economic development, poor soils, and few natural resource advantages, the Ivory Coast became one of the few African nations whose economy grew faster after independence than under imperialist rule. The Ivory Coast achieved one of the highest sustained growth rates of any black African nation without major petroleum deposits, and in fact one of the highest growth rates in the world. As of the time of independence in 1960, real per capita income in the Ivory Coast was slightly less than in neighboring Ghana but its per capita income grew at more than 4% per year for the decade of the 1960s, compared to less than 2% for the decade of the 1950s under French rule. By 1982, real income per capita in the Ivory Coast was 50% higher than it was in 1960, and was now also 65% greater than in Ghana. The Ivory Coast also remained one of the few countries in Africa that could feed itself. These policies produced a prosperous peasantry and frustrated westernized intellectuals, in contrast to the reverse in other African states. In the first quarter of a century after independence, agricultural output in the Ivory Coast doubled, and private consumption, exports, and gross domestic product all increased three- or fourfold, while the initially very small manufacturing sector increased fivefold. In little more than a quarter of a century, the country's per capita income rose tenfold, becoming the highest in any black African nation without petroleum deposits. Among the consequences of these policies was that the Ivory Coast often had balanced budgets and avoided international balance of payments problems that plagued other third world countries. Although the Ivory Coast had its economic and social problems, including corruption, these did not compare with the chaos, starvation, or mass killings in some other African nations. But its relative success brought neither the country nor its president the kind of attention or acclaim lavished on others, such as Tanzania's Nyerere or Ghana's Nkrumah. Houphot Bonny embraced few of the fashionable ideas, from pan-Africanism to socialism. He was also one of the very few African leaders ever to have run a business enterprise. Other political office holders in black Africa, whether at the top or elsewhere in the political and bureaucratic pyramid, tended to come disproportionately from a white-collar or professional background, including school teaching. Former clerks alone accounted for one-fifth or more of the members of the legislatures of Ghana, Senegal, Guinea, and Tanzania, two-fifths or more of the legislatures of Niger, Mali, and Upper Volta, and four-fifths in the former Belgian Congo. In the Ivory Coast as well, at the time of independence in 1960, the previous skills of about 40% of the members of the National Assembly and the Cabinet were either clerical or educational, and two-thirds had worked for the government. But because of the great role of the head of state in African nations, the fact that the president had a different background apparently accounted for the very different policy approach of the Ivory Coast, and for the very different economic, social, and political consequences. Houphouet Boigny's policies not only contrasted with those of Nkrumah in Ghana, the two leaders made a famous bet as to which approach would prove to be more successful. Although Ghana was the more prosperous country at the time and was more richly endowed with natural resources, the subsequent reversal of their respective economic standings was a dramatic demonstration of the effects of the two approaches. Even as regards the social position of the poor, one of the prime talking points of Ghana's more left-wing policies, the Ivory Coast's policies bore fruit. Although income was less equally distributed in the Ivory Coast than in Ghana, 
people in the bottom 20% of the income distribution in the Ivory Coast had twice the real income of people in the bottom 20% in Ghana. Indeed, the bottom 20% in the Ivory Coast averaged higher real incomes than a majority of the population of Ghana. Partly this was because real income was rising in the Ivory Coast and falling absolutely in Ghana. Also, it must be noted that even the top 20% in the Ivory Coast, the rich by African standards, were making quite modest incomes by the standards of Western Europe or the United States. That this impressive record was due to the policies the country followed, rather than to natural resources or other advantages, was painfully demonstrated in the late 1970s and in the 1980s, after the Ivory Coast succumbed to the political temptations which had so badly affected the economies of other African nations. Instead of continuing its policies of concentrating government expenditures on creating infrastructure and letting the private marketplace produce goods and services, the country's new policies, beginning in the late 1970s, shifted government investment into manufacturing and other state-owned enterprises. Favorable prices for the Ivory Coast's largely agricultural exports brought in the money required to finance such ventures. Moreover, the country's good economic reputation internationally enabled it to borrow abroad. However, such transient good fortune provided no basis for an enduring policy. When the prices of such exports as coffee and cocoa fell in 1978 and the oil shock world recession struck in 1980, a whole era in the economic history of the Ivory Coast came to an end. Between 1975 and 1980, the country's external debt rose by 400%. By 1990, the cost of servicing its international debts absorbed 39% of its export earnings, compared to just 7% 20 years earlier. Even during its earlier good years, when observers spoke of the Ivory Coast's economic miracle, it was not a completely free market economy. Even then, its ventures into the kinds of state regulation engaged in more widely by other African nations had not had good results. For example, the availability of soft foreign aid loans for centralized government planning of rice production led the Ivory Coast into policies that produced a glut of heavily subsidized rice that taxed the storage capacity of the government, cost the national budget far more than originally planned, and led to consumer prices far above those at which rice was available on the world market. Beginning in the early 1980s, the country's national income declined absolutely, while population continued to grow. The long period of one-party and one-man rule likewise ultimately began to take its toll on the Ivory Coast in corruption, in economic problems, and in political repression. In 1992, the capital city of Abidjan had its worst riots since independence, with political opposition leaders being imprisoned. After the death of Houphouët Boigny in December 1993, he was succeeded constitutionally, on an interim basis, by former National Assembly leader Henri Conan Bedi. Bedi's chief rival for the presidency, Prime Minister Alassane Dramane Ouattara, resigned upon Bedi's extension to the presidency. This, and a long period of national mourning, during which political activity was muted, contributed to a smooth transition. Privatization, begun in the last years of Houphouët Boigny, continued under the new regime, and this helped turn the economy around. After years of declining national output, the Ivory Coast's real gross domestic product began to grow again, first by a modest 1.8% in 1994, and then by a robust 7% the following year. After serving as interim president for nearly two years, Bédier was elected in his own right in October 1995, with an overwhelming victory at the polls. However, this presidential victory, winning 96% of the vote, was tarnished by the fact that two opposition leaders were barred from running and opposition rallies were forbidden. Moreover, despite favorable economic and political trends, the new president began jailing journalists for even mildly critical writings. Earlier, in May 1995, Bédier's government arrested 11 army officers on suspicion of plotting a military coup, though no specifics were made public. Amnesty International has charged the Ivory Coast with jailing more than 200 people for their political opposition. By and large, where the Ivory Coast followed its own pragmatic policies in the first decades after independence, it was successful both economically and politically, 
at least in the sense of avoiding the traumatic problems of other tropical African nations. But where it followed policies more like those of other African countries, it suffered many of the same consequences.